So this is my third in the OSI series tech talks and my I lost track of how many in the month of Regner. Um, this is about layer three. Um, this is where things actually start to get interesting as far as networking because the term network actually happens here at layer three because this is the networking layer. Um, so we talked about layer one, the physical layer. Um, we talked about layer two, data link, um, which handles that lower level. <clears throat> um, just as a heads up for people tracking this series, um, our next OSI tech talk will be, I think it's scheduled for after I get back from vacation, but it will be combining all four of the remaining layers at once. Um, most of it will be about TCP, about TCP and UDP at the transport layer at layer four, but we'll also be talking a little bit, as little as you can, about the presentation and session layers, which nobody knows about, and what all of you developer -y types do at the application layer. So at layer one, we had the physical medium, the actual electrical and optical signaling that transmits data from, from one device to another. The types of physical manifestations of layer one are things like your cables, the transceivers, like, like a GBIC or an SFP or something like that plugged into a switch. And actually modems too, that's something I failed to mention during that tech talk is that modems are also a layer one device um, because they're modulating and demodulating things between physical mediums. <clears throat> um, you'll have no idea how much of an enlightening moment it was when I realized that modem stands for modulator demodulator. Anyways, uh, layer two, we talked about access, media access control, um, local communications, and how it handles um, any sort of potential problems of a shared medium. Uh, the devices and the hardware at that level were things like hubs and bridges, which we later learned to call them switches. Um, but here at layer three, we have a few other terms to know about. Um, so the first thing that you'll hear me talk about are network segments. Uh, that is essentially a layer two domain. Um, and any local network, any local area is a networking segment. Um, instead of talking about frames like we were at layer two, now we're talking about packets. So I'll try to keep my terminology correct, and you should too, that at layer two we're routing packets. Um, <clears throat> Okay, uh, um, at the physical device at this layer are going to be routers. Um, in today's day and age, it's actually router slash layer three switch. It's a very blurry device space. Um, and then the actual definition of a network, uh, was, well, I can't really say that this is an actual definition because I didn't actually look it up or anything, but um, a series of those segments of these local networks, if you interconnect them with routing protocols and IP addressing and stuff like that, that is a network. Um, and <clears throat> um, just looking where it knows here. Yeah, so I'm um, back early, early on in the beginnings of networking when people weren't really sure what all of this trendy stuff was going to turn out to be. Um, you would you had these giant monstrosity routers and they would have like two or three interfaces and you would have one side and another side and that would be a router and its entire purpose would be to route traffic between these two sides, these two networks, which probably aren't even using the same technologies at all. Um, and then, you know, routers get bigger, you a few more interfaces, so you have routers with like five interfaces or something like that. I um, mean, even an ISP in the early days may only have had, had to need a few different interfaces to route between these different network segments that they bridged between, you know, if you have, you know, your your network off to the east of a city and then your network off to the west or something like that, and that's you know, overall, you know, like you, we think of routers and networking equipment with hundreds of interfaces or whatever at, at, at large scales, but it wasn't always like that. Um, so that, that's especially if, when I was working at Cisco a lot it became really, really confusing, and eventually you just stopped trying to tell the difference between a router and a switch. Um, there are obviously differences between what they're doing. Um, a switch is at layer two, only making decisions based on MAC addresses and forwarding and stuff like that. But when you have a switch that has 48 ports on it, and it can have a different VLAN on every single one of those ports, and it can inspect layer three information and make routing decisions, then what is it? Is to stop trying to care. Um, 
so as networks grew, um, engineers kept trying to plug in more and more things, and so uh, Cisco and other networking gear manufacturers start making layer three switches that do the same thing as routers, and people stop trying to tell the difference. So um, at layer three, we have, um, oh, I guess the only new information here is that um, this is where the internet begins. Um, the internet is an interconnected series of networks, and so from here on out, we're gonna be talking about not just things that happen between this closet and that closet, your device and a, and a router or whatever like that, but this is things of a global scale now because uh, you need the IP protocol or you need networking protocols to be able to communicate with devices across further distances. And so this is where those large scale things come in. But first, a quick little quiz. Does anybody know what Sammy the network seal says? Arp, 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 arp. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, so this is the, I, I'm starting out with this because this is the translation between our previous layer, layer two and uh, layer three. So whenever, um, as most of you will know, uh, whenever a host needs to figure out what you know, it, it's sitting on a network and it knows because of its configuration that we'll get into later that I am on the same network segment as another host that I need to communicate to. So I can't send my packet off to a router and give it back to the other host because that would be dumb. I need to talk directly to that host and so you need to have that host's MAC address and so this is how you do it. Um, it sends out a broadcast message saying, hey, I need to know who has this IP address and here's my IP address so you can reply back to me and then that host, if it's listening and properly configured, will answer. Um, the uh, other interesting, the only interesting point that I would make here is that about um, gratuitous ARP. So that's something that you're not, usually don't see unless you start looking at high availability clusters or um, high availability networking protocols. Um, but that's just a way of saying that a system, when a system sends out an ARP reply without waiting for an ARP request, um, the packet itself is pretty much the same. It's just saying, hey, this is my IP address and here's my MAC address because it's tied up into that Ethernet frame, it's MAC address. Um, that's, a lot of systems will do that when they first plug in. Um, you may even actually see your own like desktop or workstation do that when you first plug into a network. It'll send out a bunch of packets, a bunch of gratuitous ARPs saying, here's my IP address. Um, that's not just for other hosts to see but also for like switches and network devices to see. Um, in the last tech talk, we were talking about how do those CAM tables on switches get populated with um, a host's MAC address on that port. Well, if the first thing that your host does when it plugs in is send out a bunch of packets with its own MAC address as a source, then that's gonna populate those CAM tables and that'll happen immediately as the link comes up. <clears throat> so you see there's a nice little transition here between link comes up at layer one, we get our MAC address at layer two, and then we send out gratuitous ARPs on layer three saying, here I am, and then everybody works. Neat, huh? Yeah. Um, and also for, as I mentioned, for failover systems, um, if you have a, a virtual IP floating between two systems, that's how that virtual IP moves between those two systems, assuming that they're on the same network segment, which is a prerequisite for high availability clusters like this, is that um, the system that wants to own that IP will send out a gratuitous ARP telling all of its neighbors in that segment, most importantly, the load balancer or the, um, or the router in that network segment that I have this IP address now and it's on my MAC address. And hopefully the previous system doesn't respond for that. <coughs> um, oh, I also wanted to point out, uh, I'm gonna be showing a few examples later on of my own home router and different routers and output and stuff like that from different devices. So. Uh, you'll see on the top entry here in my ARP table, that's my internet Comcast default gateway on ETH0, and then ETH1 is my internal interface, and those are some of the hosts on my home network. And if you were to plug these into a, a OUI decoder or whatever, you'd find out that that top one is owned by some you know, cable modem company, and the other ones are other Intel and Zen systems that I have at home. <clears throat> um, I'm hoping to also 
through the through the presentation of this to dispel some any lingering fear about IPv6. So we'll talk about the two major networking protocols at the same time here. Um, a lot in the difference between IPv4 and v6 is that v6 has been simplified. It's more optimized. Um, it's not just about more addresses. Um, so you'll see that the fields here in red are stuff that have been removed from IPv6 and have been, in a lot of cases, moved to be like an optional extension that you can specify in the payload of your um, IP packet. But uh, in the layer two header, you'll remember that you had some basic stuff like a size, a checksum, you had some source and destination addresses. So you've got a lot of the same here. You've got a source and destination address on both sides. Um, there's a version number which tells systems what they need to do to interpret this packet. Um, some other things I'll point out in here is that the TTL or the hop limit as it's called in v6 is essentially how traceroute works is that it just incrementally keeps sending out um, packets with higher and higher TTLs and watching as each one dies. So as a router or a layer 3 device is getting a IP packet and if it sees that TTL header it decrements it by one and if it hits zero it drops that packet because it's expired and sends out an ICMP message that says this message, this packet has died because of time to live exceeded or whatever. Um, <clears throat> and so if your systems are supporting all of that, then you'll see those messages back in Traceroute. We'll know the topology of your network. Uh, the protocol header here is, um, again, just like at layer two, we had a protocol header indicating what layer three protocol we're using. Here at layer three, we have a header that indicates what layer four protocol you're using. So um, things in the, that you can put in there are, are codes for things like TCP, ICMP, IGMP, UDP, OSPF, and all sorts of other alphabet soups. Um, uh, IPv6, it's a simplified header, and as I was saying, like, you have a lot of extensions at the end, um, at the end of the header before the data, which isn't on this diagram, but um, that's how it's a lot more of an extensible protocol that um, assuming we don't exceed the ridiculously ungodly number of addresses required, this will probably be the last internet protocol you ever need because you can keep extending it without breaking backwards compatibility. Um, <clears throat> the type of service header here and um, in the v6 equivalent traffic class or the flow label are, it, it's been renamed in modern versions of, uh, modern implementations of IPv4 to become like the differentiated services code point and the explicit congestion notification head fields, which I really don't want to get into the differences between all that. But basically, the meaning of all that is that it is a way for the originator of a packet to tell all the devices that are going to be routing and handling that packet and its ultimate recipient how to handle it in regards to its precedence, what sort of delay that payload, that data can handle, what sort of throughput it expects, what sort of reliability it needs, even things like the monetary cost that should be expended in routing this packet. Um, like if you have a router that has maybe three general purpose WAN links and then a fourth backup link which you have to pay for every single bit that goes through it, but you only want to use that if the other three are really saturated or something like that. Then you can configure it to say, don't use that fourth expensive link unless the monetary cost or whatever of this packet is high enough that we really want it to get through. Um, and then for other protocols like uh, voice over IP and even like real-time gaming protocols, um, you may be able to deal with a certain amount of loss, especially if you're using something like UDP. And you'll set something like the, the delay low, say that I want this packet to go through with minimal delay, but if its reliability has to suffer, fine, so be it. Um, so those are the um, options that are specified here at layer three because routers and other stuff are going to be the ones that have to make those decisions. Your router at home will never make those sort of decisions. It'll just try its little best to do everything it can, but like your ISP and stuff, routers at your like internet exchange points and stuff like that, which we'll talk about in a later talk about. <clears throat> um, the next major thing to, to go over with layer three is addressing. And first, um, 
we're just going to completely ignore the concepts of class, classful routing. Like you probably have heard things like class A and class B and class C networks. I'm just gonna pretend those don't exist because they really haven't for the last 15 years. Um, so here we have two addresses. You'll, the first one um, ending in dot 32 slash 27 is a CIDR notation uh, for saying that that's the network address, 10.10.1.32, um, and then slash 27 is, means that there's 27 bits that specify the network, network ID of that um, host address. And then dot 44 is an address within it. And so, <coughs> the top number is the binary representation of that first one, of the dot 32. And you'll see the last five bits at the end have been grayed out. So those last five bits are the 32 minus 27 is five, yeah, five bits of the host ID. Um, and then you'll see that the binary representation of dot 44, the first 27 bits are the same, which means it's in the same network, which means that we can use something like ARP to talk to it, or to discover its MAC address and talk to it. Um, but the binary representation of a different address, say like dot 90, doesn't line up. It has a different network ID in the first 27 bits. And this is how subnetting works. So if you can do enough of this in your head and be able to like, see what 32 looks like in binary in your head and then compare that to what 44 looks like and then compare those first three bits of 32 and 44 and see if they're the same, then you can do CIDR notation in your head. And no, this does not come immediately. And no, I'm not a genius because I can do it. It's just because I've been doing it for eight, 10 years that I can do it. Yeah, um, the CIDR notation is all about binary prefixes. Um, in IPv4 or v6, you'll have slash something, and that's always the length in bits of that prefix. So you always have to think about it in binary. Um, if, you're, if your prefixes are always multiples of four, then you can do it in hex, because a hex digit will be four bits. Um, and with IPv6 CIDR notations, it's a lot more common actually to see multiples of four. So you can actually do it in hex um, a lot easier with IPv6 just because of that reason. But ultimately it, it just correlates to binary. For whatever reason they thought that decimal addresses would be easier and so with IPv4 at least we have to keep converting between decimal and binary and very rarely do I ever see v4 expressed in hex. Um, and I've also been told to mention the Wikipedia article on CIDR. Just go into Wikipedia and search for CIDR. Um, and it has a very long table, which I will not show you here, but um, giving you very explicit comparisons of all 32 different uh, CIDR masks that you can have. <coughs> oh, and um, the other thing, the reason that it's called a mask, like if for any of the non-computer science people out there, um, when you see a net mask expresses like 255.255.252 .255 or whatever, um, again, that's all just binary. So if you convert all the, that entire mask into binary, you'll see that it's a sequence of ones, and then at some point it ends and becomes a sequence of zeros. And so if you have a slash, I'll try to do this live. Um, if you have a slash 23 mask, for example, that will end, there'll be 255.255.254.0 in decimal. Um, so that is a sequence of 23 ones and then nine zeros. I did that one easily because that's my actually my home mask. <coughs> Make sense? Okay, cool. Um, I wanted to point out some, oh, that didn't come out very good on this slide, oh well. I want to point out some common addressing for IPv4. Um, RFC 1918 specifies the private networks that we all know and love and use at home in, in internal networks and stuff like that. So that's 10 slash 8, 172.16 slash 12, and 192.168 slash 16. Um, for your loopback address, for whatever ungodly reason, they thought that you would need an entire slash eight for your local host, and so it's 127 slash eight. You can actually set any of those addresses on your loopback interface and it'll work. Um, I don't know why, but okay. 
Um, there's 169.254 slash 16, that's your link local. Um, this is a lot more common on IPv6, which we'll talk about in a moment, but um, if your system is configured to auto-configure addresses and it, it doesn't get a DHCP reservation, you don't have a static address set or something like that, then it will give itself some random address inside that slash 16. Um, Apple devices and anything running the the Unix or the Linux Avahi daemon or whatever will do that. Um, Windows too, actually, I think. So that's that's actually how I was airplaying last time is because I just allowed the two MacBooks to create their own addresses on the local network. Um, IP multicast is an entire slash four, so that's um, that's eight. No, sixteen slash eights altogether, right, Kyle? Yeah. Okay. So 224 slash four um, is reserved for all sorts of different multicast purposes. Um, a company can actually request to have a specific multicast address out of that assigned to them. And then if you have, I don't know, if you're a streaming video service or something like that, you can register that multicast address on the internet and people can subscribe to it and receive your multicast streams. That's not how any streaming video service works on the internet, but you could do that. Um, <coughs> The global broadcast address, like if you don't know your network address, but you need to send an IP layer three packet out with a broadcast address, that's all ones, or 255.255, et cetera. Um, and then if you don't know your own address or your own network address, but you need to send a packet out, but you don't have an address of your own to use, then you'd use all zeros. Um, and that entire slash eight, zero slash eight is reserved for that purpose then everything else pretty much is up for grabs for um, public registration. Um, in IPv6, there's a lot more than this, but I just pulled out a few of the interesting ones. Um, loopback localhost only has one, uh, one address assigned to it, which is colon colon one slash 128. Um, link local, the 169.254 equivalent in IPv4 is FE80 slash 10 but in practice, it's FE80 slash 64 um, for a V6. Multicast has um, an entire slash eight for it in IPv6. And then every single globally routable unicast address on the IPv6 internet is assigned out of 2000 slash three, um, which means 2000 colon colon all the way up to 39999 or 3999, no. Sorry, this is a text. Three F F F F slash whatever. Um, so if you do, uh, if you look up, if you've ever been wondering how come everybody's IPv6 address always begins with 2001 or 2002 or 2600 or whatever, it's because their IANA, who controls all these assignments, has decided that all V6 addresses are going to be assigned out of that entire block. <coughs> uh, speaking of IANA. Um, all IP addresses, whether it's v4 or v6, um, are assigned hierarchically. So there is a governing body, the Internet Association for Names and Addresses or whatever, um, who they essentially own all of the IP space in any protocol. Um, and they will delegate pieces of it to regional registries. And so Aaron is a registry for North America, and they have delegated 23 slash 8 to Aaron. And then a company in ISP like Rackspace, for example, will say, hey, I need some more IP space for all my servers. And um, Aaron will confirm with Rackspace that they have a justified use for all that space, and then they'll delegate to Rackspace 23.253 slash 16. And then we say, great, okay, so that's a lot of addresses. We don't need them all in one place. And so Rackspace decides to put these three prefixes, uh, slash 19, and another slash 19, and a slash 18, and and um, route them all to our ORD data center. Um, the others are routed to DFW and elsewhere. Um, and then within that ORD data center, we'll have an aggregation router which says this uh, 23.253.6.64 slash 30 is assigned to the Rackspace.com environment. And if you look up um, host www.rackspace.com, you'll actually see it's coming from that address pool. So. Make sense? Yeah. Cool. 
Um, those regional ed registries, as of 2005, when the most recent one was created, um, it, this is what they look like. So there are five, yeah, five regional registries for the different uh, parts of the world. So can anybody tell me how many of these registries Rackspace receives addresses from? No and no. Three. Uh, we have data centers in North America, in London, and in Sydney and Hong Kong. So that touches in order Aaron, um, Ripe, and Apnic. Um, and in 2005 or whatever, um, Afrinic was created. Before that, it was up to a combination of Aaron and Ripe to manage Africa. So that's where your IP addresses come from. Oh, and when they say we're out of IPv4 addresses, um, that's mostly true depending on who you ask. So IANA has no more addresses. They have no more slash eights to give out to a regional registry anymore. The regional registries, they still have addresses and to varying degrees, like um, APNIC, APNIC or whatever for Asia Pacific, they got the last slash eight from IANA. Um, and because of the huge explosive growth in China and other Southeast Asia economies and countries, um, there's lots and lots of addresses there for future growth and expansion. Um, Aaron, in, for, because of the United States, of course, has lots of addresses there too. And then there are dwindling amounts of addresses in things like the Latin America, NIC, and um, Afrinic and stuff like that. So it'll be a matter of time before they, the regional registries are out too, but that's where we're standing. <coughs> and of course, we've got truckloads of IPv6 to spare. Um, so routing tables. Uh, routing tables is how you make a decision about where to go. Um, in layer two, it's a very easy decision to make because you have a physical link that is on a network segment and you can only send a packet out that direction. And that's, you know, you, you have a MAC address that you learned off of this port and that's how you talk to it is through that same port. Um, it's more complicated with layer three because packets can be going in and out of different interfaces and you have different size networks in different directions. And so a routing table is a way of following a few simple rules to figure out where your packet's going to go. Um, the first rule is that it matches the destination IP with the host, so that um, CIDR header, that, or that CIDR example we were looking at with the network ID. Um, you have, it looks at the network mask of all of its known interfaces and compares that to the destination address and whenever it finds one, um, or no, it looks at the network ID of all of its routes and compares that with the destination address. And so um, whenever it finds one where the masks all match and you have the destination address and your network ID are the same, then it knows that this is a valid route for this destination. Um, you can obviously have more routes than, um, than, or you can have more matches than just one. So. If you have a more specific route, that will always win, and we'll see an example of that in a minute. And you can also have a, a cost or a metric assigned to a given route so that you can have two identical routes, but one of them's more expensive than the other because it takes more hops to get there, or it's a more, it's a more expensive link or something like that. Um, it will take that into consideration too. So <clears throat> this is an example public routing table of some arbitrary server somewhere, possibly in Dallas, and You'll see it has two interfaces. I took the liberty of color coding them for you. So on bond one, that looks like to be our external interface because it has publicly routable addresses on it. Um, and then the blue one, bond zero, is our local inside interface for, um, uh, for because it has RFC 1918 addresses, which would not be globally routable. And the Different operating systems will print these in different orders, and order sort of matters depending on your system. Like Cisco's routing table order really does matter. Um, Windows, not so much. So mainly just think about the rules I talked about before. Like usually you'll just find a match that matches the network ID. It's the most specific, specific and that's the route it'll take. Um, so you'll see down here, um, at the second from the bottom, there's a route for 10.128 slash 9, so that is half of 
half of a class A or half of that entire space. Um, and then also you'll see the second route is 10.133 and then the mask is much larger. Um, that's a slash 18, I think. So um, if you have a destination address within that's like 10.133 I don't know, 9.9 .9 or whatever, um, it would technically match both of those routes because the network IDs match and the masks match, but the first, the one higher up here on the list is more specific because it's a more specific match, and so that's the route it'll take. And you see there that um, we have several different um, connected interfaces. Like if we look, uh, da, 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 da. so looking at the the gateway IP addresses here, we can infer that our local address in bond zero is something like 172.31.0. something. And so there's many different hosts on that network that we're sending traffic to for different uh, destination networks. So it's almost like this is acting as like a Linux router or something like that in some sort of a production environment. Interesting. <clears throat> um, so, and this is my home router's v IPv6 routing table because we don't have any one of those that I can access here at Rackspace. Um, and so on my external interface, I have a single address assigned to that device. In IPv6, um, routes are a lot more device-centric and because you can have IPv6 makes a lot more use of link local addresses, the FE80 stuff. And so, you know, if you have 90, or if you have a handful of identical FE80 routes, it's not very useful unless you know which device it applies to. So, um, <coughs> I have a, my external public interface is ETH0, and my ISP gives me that long 2001 IPv6 address. And then they also give me a 2601 um, slash 64 that I could delegate to my internal hosts um, inside my network, and that's assigned to ETH0, ETH1. Um, and then my default route is an FE80 address, which is assigned to ETH0. So that FE80 address could exist on both sides, but the route specifically says your default route is out this interface. Then you have two identical FE80 routes. Um, for your own link local devices, but those wouldn't, wouldn't collide because it's interface specific. <coughs> and I think, yeah, that's all I got. Do you have any questions? Um, I will be doing another talk, like there's some stuff I left out of this because I'm doing another talk later called How the Internet Works, um, talking about how different ISPs interconnect, how you, how a little bit of internet history and how the internet is actually built up using protocols like BGP and other sort of routing stuff. So this is, I guess you can consider this like 60 or 70% of IP. <laughs> Any questions from here or on video? Okay, um, the question was about uh, how does it determine cost in routing tables? Um, Different routing protocols like EIGRP, OSPF, um, BGP, RIP even, um, oh no, not RIP, but they all also allow you to say this route is has this cost and it's sort of like an arbitrary relative number within each protocol. Um, and actually, if you're a Cisco device, you respect those costs from different protocols differently. So like a BGP cost is more important and given more weight than an OSPF cost or than a RIP cost and so on. So um, some protocols, it'll be as simple as the number of hops. Um, so if I receive a route from a router, but it says that I received this route from a router which is three hops away, then if I were to send a packet to my local router for that route, um, it would be an additional four hops before it gets to its destination. So that may not be the most optimal route to get there. But I still know that route, and I'll still take it and put it into my routing table. Um, if that's the only option I have. Um, your local workstations usually don't care because for one, they usually only have one router, your one default gateway. And for two, um, you know, the desktop operating systems, Windows, Mac, Linux, aren't usually smart enough to, I guess, make those sort of sophisticated decisions based on multiple routes they receive. Um, 
What I have seen done on some Linux routers, though, is um, hand coding uh, arbitrary costs to different routes. That, like, if you'll have a static route going this direction for some internal network, and then another direction for that same network, but a different host or a different router, um, but you want to prefer this one over that one, and the second one's only there for a redundancy or something like that, then you'll set a higher cost on the second one so that Linux will only use it if the first one goes down or if you get if that route disappears because that interface went down or something like that. So locally it's not used much, but for redundancy and on the internet it's used a lot. And we'll talk about that when we talk about BGP in the next uh, networking related tech talk. Uh, my provider at home is Comcast. Do they honor QoS? Um, I don't know. A lot of home providers, if I was a home ISP, I wouldn't um, because I would only want customers doing on my network what they are paying me to do on my network. And um, I'm sure internally they do. Like I'm sure Comcast offers, I assume they offer phone service. Um, so internally and within their own backbone, I'm sure they honor at least their own VoIP services versus customer's data or whatever. Versus, you know, if you're a Netflix subscriber in Nevada with Comcast, then probably your QoS is tanked. Um, it's a little bit of an internet media joke. Um, but as far as a QoS of a packet that you send them from your own modem, probably not. They, they would probably override it with whatever they want, well, however they want your traffic to be prioritized within their backbone. Yeah, you know, anybody that sees that packet and has to retransmit it, whether you're a switch or a router, is capable of overriding it. Um, they'd recompute that checksum and send it along the way. Really, all of this sort of stuff, until we get into things that involve encryption, anything here is like a kind request to the next person to please do this thing. And they can dev null it if they want. Yeah, I have, not from Comcast, but I have seen other ISPs that um, the, gate, the gateway device that they ship you um, actually is spitting out packets to their same default gateway. So it's the same layer three network routing topology and everything like that, but the QoSs are different on VoIP traffic versus your normal ethernet data traffic or whatever. Um, so it's, it's certainly, I guess that's actually what it's intended for, is for you to um, set what, packets are real-time QoS level and not, but Comcast, I'm sure, doesn't because, well, everybody knows what Comcast is. No, that, um, those IPv6 addresses came from Comcast. Yeah, um, I, from what I was reading, actually, most uh, provide most Comcast uh, franchises or whatever do this, but um, there you'll get if you just do DHCPv6 to on your Comcast modem, you'll get a slash 128 assigned to your interface, and then if you specify the PD extension in your DHCPv6 request, which is prefix delegation. Um, that tells Comcast that, hey, I'd also like my own prefix along with my own address, and so that's where that 2601 slash 64 prefix gave. They, Comcast actually gives me a slash 50, no, a slash 60, and then I picked one of those slash 60s, or a slash 64 out of that slash 60 and assign it to my hosts internally. And then with, with a little bit of IP6 tables, then you can make sure that nobody can hack into your internal hosts over IPv6. Yep, I'm just a regular cheapo home level customer, yeah. No, um, that would require it to be rerouted through some other networks. That's actually something else I didn't mention about IPv6 is that there's a lot of extensions in IPv6 that increase its effectiveness for mobility. Like there's an entire 
slash eight or whatever in IPv6 space dedicated to mobile addresses that can be easily reassigned from router to router across the entire internet as you're moving. Um, it's actually something I don't know a whole lot about, but I'm sure it would be really fascinating to learn about is like how, um, like when um, I know when Verizon was rolling out LTE to all their networks, um, the end-to-end -end communication or whatever between the handset and their backend systems is all IPv6. Um, I don't know how far that translates into like where your calls and your actual web browsing data comes from, but it's out there. Internet truth is out there. <laughs> Anything else? Yes, that was an X-Files joke. Um, the question was, how does IPv6 to v4 routing work? Um, there are at least one, if not more than one, protocols out there that do 6 to 4 routing and 4 to 6 routing and 6 in 4 encapsulation and 4 in 6 encapsulation. And there's an entire swaths of address space in both v6 and v4 dedicated to that purpose. Um, for example, um, there are, there's like a slash, I'm not even going to make up any numbers. There's a big, a big part of IPv6 space dedicated to putting your v4 addresses inside of it. And so you just add this v6, you convert your IPv4 address into hex, and then you put this prefix in front of it, and then that, if you send a packet to that address, it'll be caught by your IPv6 router, and then if it supports this, it will then turn around and, sh and poop out a IPv4 packet. <coughs> Um, they'll then poop out an IPv4 packet with that same data, but translated um, to that v4 address that you specified in the v6 destination. Um, Rackspace is actually one of those providers that supports this. There are devices in all of our data centers even that um, you don't even need v um, IPv6 connectivity on your machine in a Rackspace data center to get to be accessed by IPv6. There's a there's a prefix for each of our data centers, so you just have to look it up with the NetSec team or whatever. Um, the prefix for your DC, and then put that in front of your IPv4 address that you have already in Rackspace, and then you can contact your v4 server over IPv6. What was that? Yeah, yeah, of course. You, you, it's all binary, dude. D binary. And there's all sorts of other, you know, that's just one example, but there's all sorts of protocols that go every which direction with IPv4 and 6, some more useful than others. Yeah. Um, and some of them are simpler to support than others. Like that one that I was just describing is pretty simple for a router to, to support, and it has very minimal cost on the, on the service provider doing it. Others um, involve, you know, tunneling and stuff like that, and you have to have, like, effectively a VPN endpoint set up on both sides or whatever to encapsulate that traffic. But yeah, w whatever your connectivity is, you can get the other if you need to, if you don't have native connectivity of the other kind too. Anything else? Okay, cool. Thank you.